Welcome to Gateway Online, and we are so excited that you could join us. My name is Jen Folks, and I'm the children's pastor here at Gateway. We want to say a huge thank you to our church family for supporting our virtual VBS that happened a couple weeks ago. It was a great ministry, and the kids had a blast. We had over 275 kids and their families participate in our virtual VBS. And it was amazing to see pictures, to hear stories from parents, and to hear stories about kids who accepted Jesus for the first time. We are so excited to have them with us. We wanna remind you that every single week we provide kids resources and a kids video. It's live at 945 and is available on all of our platforms. So if you know somebody that was interested in kids ministry, please invite them to join us each week. This morning, we are gonna do communion. And so we wanna invite you to make sure that you have your elements, have your juice and have your bread. And we'll be doing that together later in our service. We also wanna say thank you to each of you who are giving faithfully to the mission that's happening here at Gateway. You're able to give in three different ways. You can mail your tithe in, you can also go on our Gateway app, or you can give online at gatewayvisalia.com. Thank you for partnering with us as we continue to do ministry during this time. Let's gather together and let's join together and let's worship this morning. online. Let's go ahead and sing together and worship our Lord and Savior. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all Joy 
Gospel of Luke uh, records something that the other Gospels don't record about communion. Now, we're taking the bread and the cup this morning, and it symbolizes the body and the blood 
of Jesus, to remind us of the great sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross. Uh, But Luke tells us something theological, that the bread and the cup, the communion service, also remind us of something else. And so he says this in verse 14 of chapter 22 of his gospel. He says, the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at table, and Jesus said to his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Uh, What in the world did Luke mean that it would find fulfillment in the kingdom of God? Uh, This past weekend, uh, my son, who's in the Coast Guard, he's a rescue swimmer with the Coast Guard, uh, moved from Tampa Bay, Florida to Eureka, California, back to the state of California. He's been in Florida for four years. We visited him once. He's come home for Christmas, but we miss him. And now that he's back in California, we'll get to see him more often. He has a small RV And so he drove his RV from Tampa Bay. He stopped at our house for three days, and then he went on to Eureka. And the interesting part about having him come to our house is it is really comfortable. We love having Nick at our house. Uh, We have great conversations. We do things that we've always enjoyed doing together. Uh, We're just, we're just, we have this familiar companionship and relationship and we love him and <laughs> hopefully he loves us and, and we just have this great time together. It's just, uh, it's just so meaningful because kids, you know, they live with you 24-7 and then all of a sudden uh, they go off into the world to college or to marriage or whatever and uh, when they come back you just fall back into those relationships and they're just so comfortable and so meaningful. And I think that's what Jesus meant when he says, I will not eat this again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus was God in heaven with the Father before he came to earth. And he says, I'm going back and and I'm going to have this comfortable relationship. I'm going back to where I started. I'm going back to be with the Father in heaven, but the great part is that one day because of my death on the cross, the shedding of my blood for your sins, you'll be with the Father. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so I think what Luke is talking about is right now we don't know what that relationship with the Father is. Uh, is going to be like. Uh, We have these pictures of heaven that there are going to be streets of gold and beautiful uh, jeweled walls and and fountains and trees and this beautiful place, which it will be. But the thing that will bring fulfillment to our heart and soul and mind and spirit is the fact that we are in the presence of the Father and all of a sudden there's a comfortableness and a fulfillment in, in, in worshiping him and being in the presence of Jesus that we wouldn't know in any other way. And that, so this morning, I invite you uh, right where you are with the elements of communion uh, to take the bread because it represents the body of Christ and to take the cup, which represents his blood. And the fulfillment of it is one day we will be in a comfortable relationship with the Father in heaven. Uh, Let me pray for you and then take the elements of communion. Father, we're so grateful that right now we speak to you and we trust and we have faith that you hear us because you tell us you do. But Father, one day we are going to be in your presence and we are going to enjoy uh, hearing the voice of Jesus Christ hearing his words to us and his encouragement to us and being in uh, the family of God. What a great, comfortable thing that will be, the fulfillment of faith. A faith will become sight, 
hope will be realized and love will be a part of the family of God. And so we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Uh, you may take the elements of the bread and the cup right now. God bless you. Hey, I got some great news for you this morning. First of all, VBS was this unbelievably magnificent success, and we need to thank Pastor Jen Folks and her whole children's ministry team. Uh, they had in excess of 370 kids, I'm sure many more than that because of the neighborhoods, all that material went into. Uh, they had uh, families from four different states besides California and Visalia participating in. So thanks so much, Children's Ministry team. You did a great job. Hey, the second piece of great news I have for you is on August 9th, Sunday, August 9th at 9 a.m., we're going to have our first uh, church outdoor service here on our church campus. It's going to be uh, on the uh, southwest parking lot outside our church offices, outside the main entrance of Gateway. We're using that because there's shade out there. It's going to be from 9 to 10 o'clock. Come bring your lawn chair. We won't provide any chairs, so uh, bring your lawn chair with you. And if you need help carrying that, we will have people to help you. Uh, we will be handing out some uh, sermon notes, uh, offering envelopes. Uh, we are going to have communion that day. Uh, if you can go online, if you're bringing your kids, go online, look at the kids page on our website, click on family resources. We have family resources. There's activity pages, coloring pages, other things for you to do with your family. Bring things with you. Come join us August 9th, our first outdoor service at 9 o'clock, where we're going to get together as a church of Jesus Christ. We ask you to follow all the CDC guidelines, socially distance, all of that stuff. We want you to participate in that, and come join us that Sunday. Also, realize there's no restrooms unless there's an absolute total 100% emergency. No restrooms. So please come prepared. Uh, also, we want to let you know uh, that uh, we will hand out some coloring pages and those things for your kids if you forget to do that. We'll be prepped for that. Hey, the question we're asking is, who is God? Uh, that's a good question to ask. Uh, but another question that flows out of that is, who am I? You know, sometimes people, when they read the Old Testament, they go, why are, all these, why are there all these bizarre stories? Uh, all these guys doing weird stuff in the Old Testament. It's because the Old Testament helps us to identify with, who am I? Uh, look at Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam and Eve are told specifically by God, don't eat the fruit of that tree. And what do they do? They totally disobey. They do exactly what God told them not to do. And if we were to show up and say to Adam and Eve, what were you thinking, eating the fruit? Well, seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. You know, you have the story of Abraham. He's called by God to leave Ur, to go to the promised land, to, to become a whole new nation. And, and while Abraham is there, he sojourns down into Egypt because he has uh, needs and he wants to go purchase things and he goes to Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, Pharaoh looks at Abraham's wife, Sarah. <laughs> and Pharaoh goes, wow, she is a beautiful woman. Who is she, Abraham? And Abraham panics. And he says, well, you know, she's my sister. And so Pharaoh says, well, I want her as my wife. And so Pharaoh takes Sarah 
And God has to intervene and stop Pharaoh and say, hey, this is this guy's wife and not his sister. He lied to you. And if we were to stand next to Abraham and we were to say to Abraham, Abraham, well, what were you thinking? Abraham would probably say, well, you know, it seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. Yeah, you turn to David. David sees Bathsheba, beautiful woman, but she's married. So David has her husband murdered. And Nathan has to come to David and confront David and say, David, God saw you. You know, and if we were to ask David, David, you know, what in the world were you thinking doing that, murdering this guy? David would probably say, well, you know, seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. Uh, you know, the Old Testament helps us define who am I. Because we look at these Old Testament characters and we see their dysfunctions and we see their sin. And it helps us go, well, you know, in my life, I've got some sin. I've got some dysfunction. I've got some things that if someone were to stand beside me after I thought that or did that or had that bad attitude and say, what were you thinking? We'd respond the same way. Well, you know, seemed like a pretty good idea at the time. You know, in this section of Ephesians, because we're talking about God's grace, uh, God giving us something that we don't deserve, his grace, his kindness, his love, his mercy. We're going to talk about that uh, this morning. And, and we're going to read this passage from Ephesians chapter 2. I, I, think it is, I think it is the magnificent treatise on grace. And Paul, the apostle, wrote this to us. And we're going to read it in total. And then we're going to kind of read it again as we work through it. Uh, as for you, Paul says to the people that are living in Ephesus that are Christians and followers of Christ. Before you accepted Christ, you were dead in your transgressions and your sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of this world who is the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time. And we gratified the cravings of our own flesh. We followed our flesh's desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of the wrath of God because of our sin. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Uh, not by works, so that no one can boast. So that, uh, for we are God's handiwork, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us to do. He prepared in advance for us to do. So let's walk through this passage of Scripture, and let's identify all of the markers of of grace and of, of our dysfunction and of our sin that Paul identifies in, in this passage. He says, you know, there's really three steps to experiencing God's grace. Step number one, we have to uh, face our destructive attachments, our destructive sin, our, our destructive dysfunction. We become, we become attached to those dysfunctions. And, and Paul says it's obvious because at one point we were following the wrong leader. He says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You used to live in those transgressions and sin when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom. Uh, we were following the wrong uh, leader. Uh, from cultural pressure, people followed the wrong leader in Paul's day. And from cultural pressure, we follow the wrong leader today. Uh, if you went to the center of the city of Ephesus, uh, you would find right at the city center a temple, the temple of Diana, the temple of Artemis. And, and that temple put cultural pressure on that whole city to conform and worship the way that Diana thought was best and to worship her, a false goddess. Uh, 
And if you were to go to the center of our society today and you were to identify what is the thing that brings the greatest cultural pressure on us, uh, we would call it the TV, uh, the television. It, it is the thing that brings uh, the most uh, pressure on us. And when you, when you watch television, all of a sudden you find that, hey, it's got an ideology. It's got a philosophy. It's, it's got a road. It's trying to get us to run down. I, I love HGTV. Cindy and I, we've watched all kinds of shows on HGTV. And the other day we were watching. And all of a sudden they started talking about a home they were going to renovate for a thruple. Uh, what is a thruple? Well, it's polygamy. It's a man who has more than one wife. And all of a sudden now, in our society, it's okay to put this into television as, it's, it's okay, it's normal. People do this. We need to renovate their houses also. And yet God says that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And it doesn't say wives, it says wife, singular. Uh, but uh, some people follow the wrong leader. They get their idea of health or dysfunction from the wrong sources. Uh, we need to face our destructive attachments. We follow the wrong leader. We're energized by the wrong spirit sometimes. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Uh, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, and he can whisper in our ear, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Other people... They do far worse. You're okay. Go ahead. And, and we are, and sometimes we are energized by the wrong spirit. We are attracted to the wrong desire, Paul says in verse uh, 3. All of us who also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Do you gratify every single craving of your flesh? Do you think, I need more ice cream. I know I've eaten a pint, but I need a quart or a half a gallon. Do you gratify that craving every time it, it, it comes up? Do you gratify uh, the craving for everything that happens in your life? You know, marketing, that's what marketing is, is creating a craving in your life. In fact, I can create a craving in you right now. I can do it. Are you ready? <clears throat> How many of you just cleared your throat? See, we create a craving. If you didn't do it, you thought about it. Uh, you know, we create cravings. Do we gratify every single craving uh, that we have? I, I, you know, I think they should create a, gr a drive through at Seize Candy. I drive through that thing every single day. I'm sorry they have drive throughs at Donut Shop. I, you know, I can go through there and, 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 and eat just, we can just eat and we can gratify every craving. And Paul says that's what we do when we live in the world. Uh, all we do is we live by our cravings, what we really think we need, what we really think we want. And Paul says it's destructive. Uh, we, uh, we face our destructive attachments when we're or we don't face them when we're deceived by the wrong definition. Like the rest, we were, na the, we were by nature objects of wrath. Uh, that is Paul's diagnosis. Before we come to Jesus Christ, we are the objects of God's wrath. We are disobedient and sinful, and we are driven by our own cravings, uh, Paul says. It's called sin. That's his diagnosis. Sometimes we don't like the Bible's diagnosis. You know, sin will kill you. Uh, if, if you were to uh, go to a doctor, why do we go to a doctor? We go to a doctor for a diagnosis. You know, I, I don't really... Uh, want to go to a doctor and I walk in and I sit on his table and he says, uh, well, I didn't really major in diagnosis. I, I, I majored in bedside manner. So I can't really tell you what's wrong with you and how to get better, but I'll make you feel really good about being here. You know, we don't like that kind of a doctor. We don't like a doctor where we walk in and we sit down and he says, you know, I didn't major in diagnosis, but I majored in film filmography and and so I don't know how to remove your appendix, but I've watched the videotape, you know, I watched the YouTube, and I, and I think if I follow the directions, I think I can get that thing out. You know, that's not a doctor that we want to go see. We want to go see one who will even give us bad news of diagnosis and hopefully 
how to cure that. And that's what Paul is doing in this passage of Scripture. We need to face our destructive attachments and learn uh, God's solution to our problem of sin and dysfunction. Uh, Secondly, we need to accept God's loving provision. Paul moves from the diagnosis of our destructive attachments to accepting God's loving provision. He says, you know, God will infuse you with life. He says, because of his great love for us, God is rich in mercy. He makes us alive in Christ. Uh, That idea uh, of rich, uh, God is rich in mercy. God is not rich in a 401k. God is not rich in gold. God is not rich because he has this fantastic portfolio. He is rich in mercy. Uh, Mercy is withholding from us what we deserve. That's what mercy is, withholding from us uh, what we deserve. If you have kids, uh, you have withheld from them at times what they deserve. In fact, sometimes they just ask for it. Uh, They're begging for it, and we withhold. Sometimes we go, you know, the reason they're behaving like this is they need to go to sleep. They are exhausted. And we realize that. And so we, we have mercy on them. Uh, you know, the, uh, sometimes I would tell my kids, you know, the soul that sinneth will surely die. <laughs> but other times I was merciful. You know, sometimes they just need sleep. Sometimes they're, they're really hungry. Kids get cranky when they're hungry. And, and good parents, they exercise some mercy in the lives of their kids. They understand there's other reasons uh, for why they're doing what they're doing. Sometimes it's dysfunctional. Sometimes it's sinful. Sometimes it's just a part of living life. They need sleep. They need food. God knows us uh, that we are just infants in our thinking and our maturity, and we need his mercy, and he is rich in his mercy. And so when we accept the mercy of God, we have this infusion of life. Uh, We have this connection of empowerment. God raised us up with Christ. Uh, That mercy gives us power over death. Uh, God's mercy exercised in my life. God says, I guarantee you're going to have eternal life in the future. He gives us that guarantee of power over death. And he gives us the privilege of position. He says we're seated with him in the heavenly realms. In Christ, we have the privilege of position. When I was a junior in high school, I got my first lifeguarding job. I was a junior in high school. It was the YMCA uh, pool in Porterville, and they gave you two things uh, when you became a lifeguard. Uh, They gave you two things that gave you power. Uh, They gave you a chair to sit in which was up above, you know, like six feet off the ground. They gave you this chair to sit in. It was like a throne. You know, you got to sit in this throne. Everybody in the pool could see you because you are the lifeguard. And they gave you a second thing. You know what the second thing was? Say it. A whistle. They gave you a whistle. And when you had that chair and when you had that whistle, you had power because you were seated in the position of power. And you could tell those kids, stop running. You know, go sit over there. And, and you had power and you had authority. And Paul says, you know, when we accept the mercy of God, God raises us up and he gives us this place in the future. We are going to sit at the side of Christ. Uh, we have a place of authority and power and we will be with him in the realm Uh, that uh, he is in at that time. And and then finally, we accept God's loving provision, uh, the gift of riches, the riches of Christ. Paul says, God gave you mercy in order that, his purpose was, in the coming ages, that he could show the incomparable riches of his grace and his kindness. Uh, God wants to demonstrate to the world the riches of his grace and kindness, that he gives you position. He gives you this place. He gives you eternal life so that people will go, wow, God is merciful. God is kind. Uh, It is amazing when you're in Christ, you have these things. You know, you take a rock, we're talking about pools. You take a rock, throw it off in a swimming pool, and what happens to it? It just sinks to the bottom. It's doomed. Just sinks to the bottom. If it were, uh, you know, some kind of a rock fish, it would just drown. It would just die. You know, the rock just sinks to the bottom of the pool. But you take a rock and you put it in a plasti- plastic Skippy's peanut butter jar, put that rock inside that jar, screw the lid down, throw it in the pool, what happens? It floats. It's going to float because it's in the jar. 
That's a great illustration. When we're in Christ, uh, we have been saved. Uh, We have been given grace. We have been given mercy. We're no longer the recipients of our dysfunction and our sin. Uh, We now have the grace of God. Third step is the idea of understanding God's grace. We need to understand God's grace. The the three steps to experiencing God's grace is face our destruction, accept God's love, and understand God's grace. For it is by grace that you're saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of my works, or I could boast about it, and I can't. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. It's giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is withholding from us what we do deserve. Grace is giving us uh, what we don't deserve, just as a free gift. You know, when you get to Christmas and you give gifts, uh, sometimes you buy expensive gifts. Sometimes you buy inexpensive gifts. Sometimes you surprise people and they get what they don't even know is coming. Sometimes they've asked for specific gifts, and you give those. You know, but it's out of grace. We give out of grace. Christmas gifts came from God's gift to us initially. Uh, The reason we give gifts at Christmas is because of the gift of the Son of God that was born at Christmas that paid for our sin on the cross. Uh, We get that gift from God, and so we say, wow, I'm going to give gifts because I've been the recipient of God's mercy. I've been the recipient of of God's grace. I've been the recipient of God's kindness. I've been, I've been placed in Christ, and I'm not sinking in my sin, but I'm, my soul is now buoyant and thankful to God for what he has done uh, for me. So that brings us to our most important question. Our most important question is, you know, how do I take this 2,000-year-old material that Paul wrote and bring it into the 21st century and use it in a positive way in my life? So let's ask our most important question. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. So what? What difference does any of this stuff make to you and to me? Well, we need to live out God's purpose. That's the difference it should make. Why has God created us? And so Paul finishes this section of Scripture with purpose. He makes this gigantic purpose statement. And he says, for we are God's handiwork. Uh, That word is poema. Uh, We translate it into an English word, poem. Uh, We are God's creation. Uh, We are the the, uh, work of beauty and skill that God has created. And we are here Uh, as his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for me to do. Uh, He he prepared me for making a difference in people's lives. He he made me for making a difference in my church and in my community and my neighborhood and in my family. Uh, he, He set me up as the recipient of grace so I could be a giver, of grace and of mercy and of kindness. He was the ultimate illustration of what he wants me uh, to be. And so we need to, first of all, if we're going to apply this scripture, we need to let God uh, love us. Uh, he loves us. And if, if I understand that, I come to Christ and I say, I want you to be my Savior. I, I want you to make me buoyant above all my dysfunction and my sin, alive in Christ to serve you and do good works. I, I need to let God love me. Secondly, I need to let God change me. You know, when I think about the mercy of God withholding from me what I deserve, when I think about the grace of God, God giving me something that I don't deserve, I should think about that. Man, that is a tremendous gift. It's a tremendously expensive gift. It cost Jesus Christ his life on the cross. Uh, He gave me eternal life because he purchased it by dying on the cross. I only get what I don't deserve because Christ was willing to give his life for me. He was willing to give his life uh, for me. And so when I think about that, it changes me, changes my attitudes, changes my thinking. Ultimately, it changes my actions. And so all of a sudden, the things I do become defined by God as good, good actions of grace, good actions of mercy, good actions of kindness. Let God change you. Finally, let God use you. 
Uh, ask the Spirit of God every morning when you get up, God, I just want you to lay in front of me the good things you want me to do today. I was at, I was at Scotty's Donut Shop. This is a terrible confession. I was at Scotty's Donut Shop one morning. I stopped by there once in a great while, you know, like every, I don't know, 2,700 minutes, something like that. It's great. A lot of minutes, you know. I stop by there every once in a while. And I'm standing in line, got out of my car, stood in line, and there's a guy in front of me. Eh, he's probably 10 or 15 years older than me. And he's standing there in line, and this, uh, this young gal comes to the window and slides the screen window open and says, can I help you? And kind of smiles at him. And he says, yeah, I want this kind of a donut. And she says, okay. And she starts to get his donut. And she says something, I don't even remember the word she used, but she just said something pleasant to him. And he said, you know what, I appreciate that. That's really nice of you to, to mention that. And I appreciate that. And she smiles. And he says, you know, and it's just when you, when you interact with people and they just have a beautiful smile and they smile at you, you just made my day. And I just, I appreciate the way you wait on your customers. And he's just kind of going through this spiel, encouraging her. And I'm standing back here just kind of watching this. And I, and I'm going, man, I wish, I hope I'm like that. I hope when somebody waits on me or serves me, or, or, or just, just comes to the window, uh, I hope I can make them smile. I hope I can make them uh, say, man, I'm glad I came to work today. I, I, I appreciate the way this person treated me and spoke to me and thanked me. And, uh, you know, I just, I thought that was a great demonstration and illustration of kindness and action. Uh, just an encouragement. Uh, let God use you. There are people out there today that are just struggling with life. They may be still, you know, in that dysfunctional realm of sin, and they don't know there's a God that loves them, that there's a God that wants to be merciful to them, that there's a God that wants to shed grace in their lives and help them to be buoyant above the dysfunctions of the world. You know, you come in contact every day with people that just need a, a word of encouragement, a statement of kindness, a small act of mercy or grace. Uh, let's be God's handiwork, God's workmanship, God's poema, God's poem to the world. And, and let's make a difference everywhere we go by the grace that has invaded our minds and our thoughts and our attitudes and especially our actions. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful for this day. We have the opportunity because you have touched our lives, we have the opportunity to touch other people's lives. Help us to do that with kindness today. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe, maybe this morning uh, you have never accepted God's grace. You have never been touched by God's kindness. But you'd like to do that this morning. So I'm going to pray a prayer uh, uh, that you can pray. I'm going to pray it out loud, and you can pray this prayer silently if you want to connect with God's grace this morning. And you can pray this, this, Dear Father, thank you that Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid for all of my sins. I put my total trust and faith in him for eternal life. Thank you for giving me your mercy and your grace and your kindness. Help me to share it with others. In Jesus' name. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to dig into your word, to understand this great treatise of Paul on the subject of grace. Uh, we just thank you that you demonstrate a grace. You are the great demonstrator of grace by sending your son to die for the sins of the world, resurrecting him from the tomb, having him ascend into heaven so he sits at the right hand of the Father. And someday, uh, Father, we will gather around your throne as well, and we will have this position of eternal life in a place you call heaven. Father, help that to invade our souls so that we allow that truth to penetrate every word we speak and every action we take so that our lives are filled with the good works that you have prepared beforehand 
that we should do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for worshiping at home with us this morning. Each week, we have a number of ways that you can connect with others in our church family. We want to encourage you to connect with other people and be a part of all the different things that are happening here at Gateway. We provide on our Facebook page daily devotionals. Our Gateway Midweek is available on Wednesday evenings, as well as live worship on Thursday evenings and Saturday evenings. And we also want to encourage you to participate in our local businesses and eating out in the different businesses that we list. So thank you so much for being a part of what's going on here. We hope you have an amazing week and we look forward to connecting with you next week.